thank you, praise team. I uh, want to do things a little bit different this evening and want to review a little bit this morning and then we'll go into this evening's uh, message. Or actually, I, I want don't want to use this as a preaching time. I want to use this as a teaching time. So I'm going to ask you some questions, and I would like you to respond. And uh, hopefully we can learn together from this, uh, not only this morning, but this evening, what God has for us. So we're going to use this as more of an informal time. Uh, but this morning we talked about the parable in Matthew chapter 13. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 13. And we talked about how this was significant because Jesus changed his approach to dealing with people. He speaks to the people, the great multitudes, in parables. He tells them stories. And we suggested this morning that the reason, there's two reasons that he told stories. Number one was what? Reason number one. Why did he talk to the people? Uh, why did he use parables? Okay, to reveal truth, mainly in this, in this uh, situation to his disciples. If you want to know God, I am convinced God will reveal himself to you. Somehow, some way, he will bring a situation, he will bring a person, he will bring a book, he will bring something. If you really want to know him, he will reveal himself. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Which leads to another thing, because there's an implication that there may come a time when he can't be found. So, reason number one, he spoke to them so that the disciples, he would expose truth to the disciples. The second reason why he spoke in parables was to what? To conceal from the people, the general people that didn't know or didn't care less. We also realize that of the four soils, we realize that only one of the soils responded positively to the word that was sown. Let me ask you, is that true in our day and age? That the vast majority of people who hear the gospel will not respond. Let me suggest to you that even it was true, it's always been true. Because even when Jesus walked on earth, did the majority of the people respond to his message? No. In fact, the majority of the people, some dismissed it, some grew antagonistic towards it, to the place where they hated him and his message so much that they crucified him. So we cannot expect... And we should not expect that the, we are going to have a mass revival of our worlds. And so we talked about that this morning. Now, in our parable, in the first parable we talked about, we talked about the sower, the seed, and the soil. The soil was what? In parable number one, the soil was people's hearts. The seed was what? The word of God. Who was the sower? Who was the sower? Ah, try to trick you. The Bible doesn't say the sower, who the sower was. The Bible just says the sower went out to sow and he did what he does naturally. He does it every year. He sows the seed. Now, things are a little different in parable number two. And it is important as we study the Bible that we do not assume things. Do not assume that the same representations, the same characters, the same situations are follow through on parable number one as to parable number two. Now, in parable number two, it breaks down in the same way. We have the introduction, we have the interruption, and we have the interpretation. So let's read parable number two in Matthew chapter 13, starting at verse 24. Here's the introduction. 
Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares, or weeds, among the wheats and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. And I'm going to stop there just for a second. And there's the implication that not only did the grain produce a crop, but what happened to the tares? It also produced a crop. Okay? Now let's go on and, and uh, verse 27. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did not... Uh, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tears? He said to them, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no, lest while you gather up tears, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let them both, or let both grow together until the harvest. And at that time, at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. And then in verse 31 and 30, uh, verse 31 and 33, he has two other parables. We're not going to talk about those. So that's the introduction. A sower goes out to sow. He sows good seed, an enemy comes in, he sows bad seed, and we've got a problem. We've got good seed and bad seed in the same field. And the helpers come and say, well, what do you want us to do? We'll go and try to weed out. And, and the owner says, no, just leave it. Leave it until harvest time. That's the introduction. Notice the interruption. Verse 34. All these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables. And without a parable, he did not speak to them. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will other things kept in secret from the foundation of the world. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. Now we have the interpretation. Now he's going to signify the players and the people and the situations all involved in this. It starts out in verse 24 that we have really what it comes down to is the battle of the seeds. We have good seed and bad seed. Now let's go and we will try to identify everything and draw some conclusions about what's going on here. Verse 37, he said to them, He who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. We have, how many sowers do we have? Somebody say it. Two. Yes, excellent. Great. We have two sowers. Who are they? One we've just identified. He, the son of man. And he sows the good seed. Then we have an enemy which has been identified. And he comes and does almost the same thing. He too has seed that he sows. Now let's go and look and see what it says here. He sows good seed, verse 37. He, it is the son of man. The fields. Remember the field this, in the first parable was what? It was the hearts. Now the field's not the hearts anymore. It goes on and says there, the field is the world's. The good seeds are the son of the kingdom. And the good seed produces a crop. And the crop and the result from the good seeds are the children of the kingdom, the sons of the kingdom. And it goes on and says there, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy. Now, we've talked about this one sower here, would tells us the second sower. 
The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. So what's happening here? We have the Son of Man and the devil, and they're both kind of doing the same thing. They're sowing their seed in the world. One is a good seed and one is a bad seed. What Satan often does, what the devil often does, the devil is never an innovator. He is always an imitator. And what he does, he comes along and he imitates the good seed with his tares, with his weeds. My wife and I, we plant the garden this year and it's not doing too bad and there are, we can go out in the garden and we can look there's a weed there's a weed we're not sure about that because because it kind of looks like what we're supposed to plant you know and it, it, it looks it looks like the leaves kind of match up satan imitates the good seed, it infiltrates. So that's why when the helpers came along, it says, do you want us to, to, uh, to, to pull them out? And, and the response is, don't do it yet. There will come a time when, there will be, uh, when we will separate them, but don't do it yet. Because sometimes it's hard to tell. You've heard this idea of don't judge a book by its covers. Let me tell you, sometimes you can judge a book by its cover, and we better, better start judging some more books by their covers. But sometimes it's difficult. When I go in the garden, and I know there are some things that are weeds, but then again, there are some things I'm not quite sure of. So now let's go on and see what happens to this situation. So the devil comes along and he sows weeds among the people of God. In fact, these weeds often refer to, uh, are, are in this case, the religious leaders who dress up and pretend to be religious but really have no things and desire of God. In fact, Jesus said of the religious leaders of his day in John chapter 8, verse 44, he says, Ye are of your father the devil. And you are a liar because he was a liar from the beginning. And, and, and you are murderers because he was a murderer. And so what you have are you have the integrating of the good seed and the bad seed at the same time. So, it surprises us not that Jesus refers to these infiltrated seeds as hypocrites. What is a hypocrite? What is a hypocrite? Okay. Okay, another response? Okay, that's good. Someone else, a hypocrite. Okay, actually that's, that's what it means. He's a play actor. Somebody who's pretending to be something or not. For example, give me an example of a hypocrite. The Maple Leaf hockey, no, oh, forget that, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm done with that one. Give me an example of a hypocrite. October 31st, people dress up for Halloween. They go knocking on doors. And, and they get all sorts of junk and stuff that we have to now pay for because we... Anyway, uh, they are hypocrites. Why? They dress up pretending to be something they are not. Every time you turn on your television show and see your favorite uh, television star, they are hypocrites. They are pretending to be something they are not. In fact, Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 said of the religious leader, you are hypocrites. 
You pretend to be something. You are just tares among the wheats. Fifteen times in the book of Matthew, the word hypocrite is used. And so what happens is, verse 28, he says, an enemy has done this, and their servant said, you want us to go? And he says, no, verse 29, lest you gather up the wheats. Why did he want them to wait? Why didn't he say, yes, let's go weed it out now? Because in a garden, sometimes if you let the weeds grow with the fruit, it takes away from, from the success of your overall crop. Why did, why did the Son of Man say, let's just wait to the end? Any thoughts? Okay. Another thought? Because oftentimes, the longer things go on, the greater the judgment. Let me give you an example. And, and this might not be the best example, but suppose you, you uh, put your children to bed, and you know, they, they share the same room, and you say, okay, you guys knock, knock off on the noise and be quiet. And you go out and you're reading your paper, and all of a sudden you hear some giggling. Has that ever happened in your family there, Ryan? Yeah, giggling, you know. And, and, and you're just sitting there reading your paper and, and having your coffee, and it gets louder and louder and louder. And finally, finally, it's time to do something. By letting this go, Jesus kind of does something. He lets them build up their own indignation. Number two, it shows his long suffering and his patience towards sin. But rest assured, there will come a time. We all get perplexed, we all get frustrated, we all get, get overwhelmed by the apparent sin in our country and in the world. And we say to ourselves, why doesn't God do something? He will. And when he does, when he does, that's going to be a scary situation. So he says, just wait. Because there will come a time. Now let me ask you a question. Who, who, are, who are the people that get to reap this harvest? Who are the servants? The angels. Oh, we would just love to be one of those people that take the sickle and go and chop down the, air, the tears. But he, we're not involved in that. He says, I've got people reserved for that. Now, let's go on a little bit farther. Therefore, as tares are, in verse 40, gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice law lawlessness, and will cast him into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as a sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. The thing I gather from this passage is, we have to be careful that we are able to separate and we don't get deceived. In fact, in Matthew 24, Jesus tells his disciples three times, be careful that you're not deceived. Be careful that you're not deceived. If it, were very, if it were possible, even the very elect of God would be deceived. We need to be careful that we start to pinpoint who and what are tares and what are wheat. Now, sometimes we can't. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's, it's something we just got to leave up to God. But there are times. There are people. We turn them on television, we listen to them, and we read their books and their articles, and they are just tears. 
And even in the religious community, we have to be careful. We are fed lies after lies after lies. And we have to be into the word of God. We have to be aware that there are people who pretend to be religious, who have all the, 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 the seeming things that it would take to be children of God, but they're nothing but children of Satan. I want you to tell me some of the lies that the world or even the Christian community tells us that we need to be aware of. Some of the lies. Exactly. Lie, yeah, absolutely. Another lie that either the Christian community or the world tells us, yes. Prosperity gospel. God wants to make you healthy and strong and rich. Yeah. Another lie. Yes. God, God is obligated to save everybody. He's obligated? When, when do we, where do we get off telling the creator of this universe that he's obligated to do something that we feel he should? Another lie. Yes! Yes. You have within yourself all that you need to be a complete person. And so there's lies all around us. And as we read our books and watch our television shows and listen to even religious people on our, tele, uh, on our television, we've got to say, look, are they wheat or are they tears? Let me give you an example. I, I got a book by Erwin Lutzer. It's called Ten Lies About God. And he goes through some of these. I'm just going to read you the title of some of the lies that he lists that we buy into. Uh, God is more tolerant than he used to be. God is more tolerant. I'm not saying he agrees with this. Please don't misunderstand. This is the title that he gives. God is more tolerant. Well, I think that's hard to say. How do we know? God judges sin in different ways. And, and I can't say that. Or maybe it's God's long-suffering that gives us the idea that he's tolerant. Here's another one. God has never personally suffered. Have, the, have these people never read the Bible? God has never suffered. Here's another one. Uh, God takes no responsibilities for natural disasters. Really? Ask him about the flood. Whose fault is that? It's God's fault. And somehow we, 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 we kind of, you know, make these sounds so, I like this one, it's so nice. God does not know our decisions before we make them. Believe it or not, I'll tell you, this was, that idea was propagated by a Canadian. I'm sorry to say, he's dead now. His name was Clark Pinnock, who was a, theology, a theologian at McMaster University. He came up with this idea that God does not know our decisions before we make them. So what does that make him? What does that make Jesus? Just a smarter man? So God didn't know Adam and Eve were going to sin? God didn't know Jesus was going to raise from the dead? you start to see how this starts to seep into us? We have to be so careful. Here's another one. The fall ruined God's plan. When Adam and Eve sinned, it ruined God's plan. I don't know how it all works. But I know God's got this all figured out. With, you see, what happens is we say when things don't go according to our way of thinking, well, it, it ruined God's plan. It didn't ruin God's plan. I just don't know how, how it helped his plan. 
we, we talk about, oh, well, if it didn't work out, God has a plan B. God doesn't have a plan B. If God has a plan B, maybe plan B didn't work out and he's got a plan C. And if plan C didn't work out, how many plans does he need? And as people, again, we need to be into the word. Here's the last one I'm even going to mention the title of. God helps those who help themselves. Satan is an imitator, and if he can imitate, if he can fool, if he can trick, if he can deceive through false teaching and false doctrine and all these things, let me give you an, a, a couple of Bible examples. Sometimes we, we get so caught up, and, and we'll say things like this, oh, we just... We, we need to pray for the Holy Spirit to fill us. I only agree with part of that. We need the Holy Spirit to fill us. We don't need to pray for the Holy Spirit to fill us because I'll tell you this, the Holy Spirit already lives in me. I don't need more, I don't need more power from the Holy Spirit. The more Holy Spirit needs more of me. And we act like somehow God has, has shafted us out of power that, that he wants us to live the, his life. Oh, we just need to pray for more power. We don't need to pray for more power. We just need to surrender more of our life to him. Would you agree? And yet, it just, it sounds so great. It sounds so good. We get caught up. I'll tell you one that really bothers me. And this is a freebie, by the way. And I'll tell you, I, I, it, it bothers me. And if, if it doesn't bother you, please forgive me. I, I don't like it when we, we say, well, let's give God a hand. Like he's a performer? Like he needs our applause? Like somehow if we clap for him, he'll be better for us? If anything, we need to fall on our knees and forget about giving him a hand. He's the creator of all. And so it's so easy to get drawn into these things that somehow seep into us. The good news is God is patient. There will come a time when there'll be judgment. It may not be this year. It may not be next year. It may not be the year after, but there will come a time. And you notice who does the separating? God does the separating. There are things that sometimes I can tell are black and white. This is definitely wrong. And there are some, some things and some people I, I say, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but I say, well, okay, God, you, you take care of them. You take care of, of what their ministry is. You take care of what they believe and what they teach. I'll try to be faithful to you. The wheat and the tares. And so he instructs his disciples, you beware. Do not be deceived. Do not believe everything you read on Facebook. Only 90% of it's true. We are so deceived. You, you, know, you know what the uh, photoshopping is, right? When you take a picture and you could either add or subtract, you know, a, a picture of a person. And, and we know that that's such a scam because, you know, you've been photoshopped in Bermuda. You've never even been to Bermuda, you know. You've, you've captured a shark. You, have, you don't even like sharks and they got pictures of you. We've got to be careful of things we hear. Not only religiously, but also on Facebook and social media and, and, and our, our political system, education system is corrupt. Be careful. Be wise. Be alert. Because the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Let's pray. Father, uh, we thank you for this parable. It's, it's simple, really. Sometimes we make your word so complicated. But would it remind us, again, to be students of your word, to be diligent, to listen with understanding so that we can be evaluators of right and wrong, truth and error, good and bad. And may you help us to motivate and encourage one another 
to live lives that bring honor and glory to you, knowing that one day there will be a judgment. One day you will make things right. But until then, we also know that we live in a world of terrors, a world of weeds, a world of ungodliness, even in the name of religion. And we would ask that you would help us to be aware of these things and help us to be aware of the tricks and the wiles and the practices of the devil. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.